fucking ninja. You're under arrest for mass fury genocide. Time for all my training to pay off. Objection! <laughs> Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney Trilogy, originally on the Game Boy Advance as separate games, ported to the DS, Windows, Wii, iOS, Android 3DS, and now the Switch, PS4, PC, Xbox One as a trilogy. Damn, man, that's got everything except for the Video Sport Mark II. It has everything but Phoenix Wright. So in Phoenix Wright, you play as a defense attorney for people who are in the complete wrong place at the wrong time that usually makes them look exactly like they did the crime. Due to some monkey ruling of government, we now only have three days to completely wrap up a murder trial and investigation simultaneously because that's totally not a completely hasty way to serve justice. Also, sometimes a death sentence is implied, but that does not seem very fair to do that in three days. Most of the cases usually end in you finding the true culprit too, by pointing fingers at everyone and bluffing half the time, even bluffing yourself that you were even following what Phoenix is insinuating. Although sometimes I was like a trillion steps ahead. So our character, Phoenix Wright, is a fresh rookie defense attorney and we're introduced to our chief, Mia Fey, with the massive personality. And we also meet Larry Vartz. Basically, we knew this wacko before, and he's carrying on like a lunatic. His girlfriend is our victim for this case, who came home from Paris shortly after being killed, but it wasn't even his bleeding girlfriend anyway. Well, she was bleeding, but... And we're into the trial. First things first, the court record, with all your evidence listed here, with relevant profiles on the back. We select the correct answers from the court record, and we meet wimpy old Winston Payne. He screams and carries on, and he pretty much sucks for a prosecutor. So now we listen to what he has to say, and the dialogue is an essential part of the game. This is when all the details are presented to you for this case in particular. The prosecution will almost always have a witness as their conclusive evidence. Thus, Phoenix must cross-examine them. So, Mr. Frank saw it testifies. Ha, ah, like saw it. Like he saw the crime. And you have to find a contradiction in what he's saying. But since people are stupid and un unreliable, we call him out. Bam. Thanks for making your oversight unbelievably clear, you fool. It clearly states in the autopsy report that the victim died from 4 to 5 p.m. The witnesses will almost always change their testimony after this, however. But he's dug his own hole and claims that he heard the time from the TV instead which is contradicted instantly by the power outage files that he himself had the prosecution submit. And now the bloody idiot says that he saw the time on the murder weapon anyway because it's a clock. Just how is this thinker statue supposed to be a clock? Saw it, you're grasping at straws. Just give up with some bleeding dignity. Thanks for telling us you know it's a secret clock, you nut. How would he have known that if he didn't go in the apartment? And bam, after some conflict from Wimpy Payne, you prove why the time he heard was 1pm. Or should I say 1am? Yeah, but wherever Phoenix lives, Paris is 9 hours ahead, not 3 hours behind. And that's where the victim visited. So this case is pretty good for the first case, just to teach you the basics. And after the trial ends, your client is saved and you organize to hang out with Mia later. Guess who's dead now? So after a call with this girl discussing evidence placed inside the thinker statue, Mr. Question Marks over here says he wants the papers shoved inside it. So now it's time to investigate the scene, and long story short, this is Mia's sister, and her name, Maya, was written on this day-old receipt found next to Maya. She is shortly arrested by Detective Gumshoe, who arrives after a report from some lady across the street. I would have called the police if the phone wasn't busted though. Maya is sent straight to the detention center and she's actually a spirit medium, not yet capable of channeling the dead. So as Phoenix begins his investigation, we start piecing everything together. We obtain firstly an autopsy report and get completely rejected by the guy we find to represent Maya. Fat loaf anyway. So 15 years ago, her mom was humiliated as the police used a spirit medium for a particular case, the DL6 incident, which was her. Some guy apparently ruined it all named White by leaking a failure to the press. The man they released was deemed innocent in the end and she was exposed as a fraud. So onto the trial on day two, we have Mr. Miles Edgeworth as the prosecutor for this case. All the establishing stuff is presented and we're onto the cross-examining of Detective Gumshoe. The next part is a major push, but we get the theory through that the killer framed Maya with that note and we do it with this autopsy report. How could she write the note if she died immediately? Wait, are you kidding? There's a new autopsy report. that. That is completely not fair. Now I guess it's time for Miss April May, aka Cat Lady who called the cops, to testify. We get her now to describe how Maya attacked and Mia dodged to the right. Finally, Maya caught her and smashed her head with the thinker clock. And there's your mistake, demon. Same as before, you simply couldn't have heard it. It was a little confusing what to question here, but Phoenix realizes that although it was possible to hear the clock as April May claims, is it possible that it could have made a sound at all? Recall the phone call at the beginning, and remember that papers were stuffed inside the statue. 
She runs out of excuses completely and- Ah, oh, demon! Demon! Bam! Our wiretap we found at her apartment is exposed, as she must have known it was a clock from the phone call at the start. She was tapping the phone. Now the bellboy finally testifies and we're able to find that there was apparently a man with her and no man during the time of the murder. Uh, who was the murderer? Time to investigate this dodgy fella. And the bellboy knows exactly who it is after we show him a photo from fat old Grossberg's office. So now we present the bellboys a full fella to April May and learn that this man is red white and he gathers information. Hmm, is he the bad guy? God, he's annoying. He literally doesn't say anything about bloody anything. Anyway, we question him about how Grossberg's beloved painting somehow ended up on the back wall and discover big rumpus over here is blackmailed by red white. Just as so, so many others are. The pig, fat, donkey pig actually leaked the fact that a spirit medium was used in that DL6 incident. And now Mia's been tracking White's every move. That case was never resolved. As Phoenix cracks out Mia's stuff, a lot of info associated with White has been tampered with. He led people to suicide, and the entire W section of Mia's shelf is gone. Next thing to do is present it all to White. Wait, Phoenix, no, what are you doing? Phoenix literally goes and shows it all to White for some bloody reason. You've done it now, Phoenix, you idiot. Time to defend ourselves, because bloody White has everyone tied around his finger. How legal even is that to defend yourself? So White takes a stand and begins to describe what he witnessed, immediately stating Mia ran to the left, as April May yesterday claimed she ran to the right. But oh, he is so sure, so Phoenix reassures he is correct in some sense. The sense that he was standing right here. He testifies that apparently Phoenix hit her twice, once having her run left and then right. But no, the correct autopsy report states a singular blow. Now he must revise once more, so we push him about hearing that thing fall. He adds the fact of the glass light stand seen at the crime scene to his testimony. But no, once more, he could not have seen that through the window. He must have been there. Oh, Edgeworth, you slimy. Apparently, White placed a wire trap a week ago. He has no problems admitting to that. Some grueling interrogation follows, but nothing solid. Until... Whoa, whoa, personalities. So, remember that note? It was a receipt from a day before the murder. For the light stand. And Mia completely bails Phoenix out. She provides a list of names, cheated them from the dead, basically, that causes Red White to break. We win again, and we head back to the Wright & Co. law offices. Overall, this case was quite a big step up from the first one, and it's really enjoyable. For the Turnabout Samurai case, we defend Will Powers, the beautiful action star behind the Steel Samurai. He was apparently asleep for the whole day at Global Studios, solid alibi, before rushing over to Studio One after the murder. The evil magistrate, or Jack Hammer, has been killed, and Phoenix is hardly able to dig up enough evidence to do really bloody anything. We gain one photo from Miss Old Bag, Jack Hammer superfan, and learn briefly of the events that day. The spear, aka a murder weapon, was snapped during a practice run between Jack and Will. And that's all. The first trial proves quite uneventful, kind of annoying when the game does this to be honest, but it doesn't quite work well here. Does it really need to be this much of a struggle? We question the fact that you can't even see who's in the costume, and this is where Phoenix will grab its straws more than Old Bag tries to grab Edgeworth. Not only this, however, but there's the fact that two photos were taken on the day. The first one was apparently just some dumb kid though. Finally, we break her, and she completely loses it, and I seriously mean she loses it. She just yaps and yaps and yaps, and there were other people present? This seriously isn't that hard in this case. It's obvious that one of these others is the culprit. The tricky part comes in proving that. Oh god, Edgy, stay back, mate. Bloody hell. Day 2 rolls around for investigations. We roll up at Studio 2, previously blocked off by a Mr. Monkey statued head. And in harsh comparison to the other plates, the T-bone steaks from the murder day have been scoffed right down, bone included. Ha, ah, got nothing on me. I would have eaten the plate. Now we meet Sal Salmonella. Beautiful. So he apparently had a meeting with some higher ups during the murder, thus they were all kept out as irrelevant. A kid sneaks in and apparently witnessed the crime. And yes, sleeping pills, it, it'll help us. Then, Dee Vasquez, and she is not the chatter. So after some hassle, she tells us that Mr. Monkey's head blocked the exit from the meeting. So you scurry around for a while and negotiate your way into getting this kid to testify for us. And apparently he saw the steel samurai kill the bad guy. So no to that, except Gumshoe takes him away. And the next day in court is a massive struggle because we still have basically nothing. We just keep pulling and pulling at loose ends and a cut off every time. Salmonella testifies they were cut off from the crime scene and Cody Hackins, the kid, testifies that he saw the Steel Samurai kill the bad guy because he always wins. And Cody told us yesterday that he's always there with the camera to take pictures of every victory. But he starts being incredibly vague, not going any further than 
Yeah, he hit him down. But what kind of murderer uses a samurai slap? And yeah, he didn't see the blow. He was taking a picture. He always does of every victory. So that means the Steel Samurai must not have won. And it was Jack Hammer in the suit. We finally get someone with the picture and Hammer actually went to Studio 2. He likely drugged Powers to steal the suit and we get the bottle tested. Edgeworth is going absolutely bloody mental by the way, like literally crushing a cup of boiling coffee in his own hand. So after chatting with Will Powers, D. Vasquez apparently saved Global Studios five years ago and helped realize Salmonella's creative juices. Powers doesn't really know why Jack would steal the suit and friggin D. Vasquez won't say a word. Stupid b Oh, there's a rumor, and Vasquez apparently had some dirt on Hammer, basically controlling him for years. There was an accident outside the trailer of Studio 2, where someone freaking died on the fence. So confronting Miss Vasquez should be easy, and so we storm the trailer, and it's just as successful as the last case. We get threatened by the Mafia! Yeah, Detective Gumshoe saves us in the end, but we were nearly dead. So in trial, Vasquez is insanely stubborn, claiming that during a break, at the exact time of the murder, she was eating a T-bone steak. WAIT! Those plates were completely bare! How can a person eat T-bone steak and not leave a bone? Now Vasquez continues on about how she simply could not have lifted such a heavy spear, yet they're forgetting it was damaged and surely flimsy after being patched up with duct tape. I believe there's something else, perfectly sharp, and that didn't have to be lifted in fact. That what happened five years ago... has happened again. And it should be obvious that the body was brought to Studio One in the van outside. In that case, she didn't even need to do it during the 15 minute break she had. It could have clearly been after the monkey was cleared around 4 p.m. since the rehearsal didn't start till five. The costume must have been burned in the incinerator because it was covered in Hammer's blood. So now what? I, I proved the possibility. We still have no conclusive proof. Objection! Yes, Mr. Edgeworth? I was hoping you'd come up with a question while I was objecting, Your Honor. I didn't. I see. Very well. I request that the witness testify again. He's realized. Yes. And now she says she forgot her papers and left to go grab them, as she asked to be left out of the proceedings. But she should have brought them to rehearsal, surely. But she knew there wouldn't be a rehearsal, and claims it's because Hammer hurt his leg. OBJECTION! Powers was the one who was injured, not Hammer. And yeah, she apparently had no motive, it was self-defense. Jack Hammer drugged Mr. Powers with sleeping pills. He then snuck in and stole the costume to fool the security lady with the camera, and all to kill D. Vasquez, who had so cruelly taken advantage of him for all those years. So as Maya looks around for a waterfall for her training, a murder has been committed at Gord Lake after Gordy, a Loch Ness monster fella, was snapped in a photo. And Edgy's been arrested for murder! Gumshoe is insanely distraught at the crime scene as there was a witness there who got him arrested. After all the help that Edgeworth gave them, the police really aren't taking his side, and he certainly doesn't want us to help. We check out the woods and find a camp set up in front of a beautiful sign and a camera positioned at the lake to take pictures at loud noises. And we meet Lotta Hart, she looks like a dang llama, apparently at uni, taking pictures of media showers. She's got us a photo of the crime too and realizes that she's a witness now? What the heck? Either way, she ain't telling us what she saw. Larry's also been hanging around on the beach of Gord Lake selling hot dogs. Maya seems to recognize the victim in the autopsy report too and hopefully this is a bloody up-to-date one. And he's a lawyer working at Grossberg's office. 
Turns out his name is Robert Hammond and was the defense attorney in the DL6 incident. The one Maya's mother was used in and Hammond apparently won the case and the meeting was called out as a fraud. The victim of the case, however, was none other than Edgeworth's father. The incident happened 15 years ago and the only person who could have killed Gregory Edgeworth was the man found by Misty Fay, the medium. And the case would be permanently disregarded in three days from now before that dumb three day law was put into place. They could be open for 15 years. This prosecutor right here, Manfred von Karma, Edgeworth's mentor, is essentially running the trial 10 times as brutal as Edgeworth. This man will object to everything, and it takes so damn long to be able to get in anything. Everything is irrelevant in his eyes, and he is dead set on the facts and his precious 40 year perfect record of guilties. Fingerprints of Edgeworth's right hand are on the gun, and the ballistics markings imprinted from the gun upon the bullet when fired match the ones from the gun. Now a witness, Lotta Hart, different to the guy who called the police, testifies. The guilty verdict is almost served, but Maya outbursts at the last absolute second to this manipulative stone pillar. And Maya takes the hit for being in contempt of court. It takes so much prodding to finally get to this tiny fact that Lotta apparently saw Edgeworth clearly and had to change her testimony. She describes her camera, talking about how it was set up for medias, but it was facing the lake. It takes ages, but she was actually scouting out for Gordy, that rubbish myth. And there's supposed to be an enlargement, but Von Karma's hidden it. Clearly, that's the left hand, not the right. It was at the start, you idiot. So Von Karma's now planning another witness for tomorrow, and Edgeworth's paid the bill for Maya, grateful for her help. So Lotta apologizes for lying in court, water under the bridge, and we have to work out a really freaking stupid deal. And it's stupid because we have to find something cool about Gordy to get some secret information she has. So Gumshoe helps us and we snag a metal detector, finding something peculiar by the caretaker's boat rental shack. It's an air tank covered in Larry's flags. Turns out the bloody idiot used it to fill up his still samurai floaty thingo, and it flew right into the lake on the day of this photo. So we explain it to Lotta and find the damn witness. And it's some weird, crusty old guy. He's completely mental and, well, he thinks the place is some pasta shop called The Wet Noodle. And, uh, he's fallen asleep. <coughs> Gah! So he heard two gunshots, bang and bang. Then a fellow, presumably Edgeworth, Maya gets the parrot in the back too, named Polly, to say a few things. Namely, the safe password. <laughs> then it says, when asked if we've forgotten something, don't forget DL6. So more about the DL6 incident. It took place in the courthouse elevator after an earthquake struck, and the three people trapped inside were the two Edgeworths, Miles and Gregory, and Yanni Yogi. Yogi was found innocent by our victim and defense attorney, Robert Hammond. That bloody Von Karma claims a three minute guilty verdict will occur, and after the old man from yesterday testifies, it becomes so, so close. Now all you can do is wince after that guilty verdict. WAIT! Larry also witnessed the murder, and it was totally different in his point of view. The verdict is thus overturned, and we slip through. This will be the first witness Von Karma hasn't manipulated in advance, so it'll be full of holes we can unravel. Larry heard one gunshot, not two, that's completely different. And secondly, it was at the complete wrong time, at apparently almost Christmas. Yet the murder happened at 12.15am on Christmas Day. But I reckon Larry was right, as a blank photo was produced by Lotta's camera at 11.50. Von Karma then shoots us down, asking who these two men were if the murder really happened at 11.50. And I say it was Edgeworth and the murderer. Edgeworth hadn't seen Hammond in years, so wasn't really suspicious when the murderer took his place, aka the old guy. Von Karma booms out that the moment we pause is the moment we lose. He must have fired twice though to create a witness and then jumps off the boat himself. But he's run off! Who is this lad? Hold on. Hold on. Edgeworth quickly admits to something as well at the end of the trial. A murder. And that's all because what the hell. During the final investigation, Phoenix explains how he knew Edgeworth and apparently him and Edgy were buddies at school and he stood up for Phoenix in a rigged class trial. It's super dramatic for no reason, but like, okay. Like seriously, a few months later, this boy, this nine-year-old Edgeworth witnessed his own father's murder. We actually patch most things up on this last day of investigation though. And as the caretaker has fled, we find a note detailing the entire plan just uncovered. The two men that ruined your life. He must be Yoni Yogi, the suspect of the DLC incident. The possibility is brought forward from Grossberg after we go visit him that Gregory Edgeworth's ghost lied about the DL6 incident to protect his son. He must have known who killed him. Edgeworth apparently threw a gun at the two others to get them to stop fighting during the incident, then all blackness. 
Robert Hammond never believed in his clients also, and only got Yogi free on the account of him having brain damage. He had to go along with it, and his life was ruined. Even his fiance committed suicide. Then we discuss Von Karma's potential grudge against Miles, as his father dealt a blow to his perfect record. Von Karma won still, but he was exposed to faulty evidence. That old cement block, the wuss, took a holiday for several months after that. We reckon as well that Edgeworth will confess to the DL6 incident. We go to check out the old files, and the evidence from then is missing. Von Karma's bloody taking it all. So Maya jumps at him as he friggin' shoots a taser. He took the letter from us too, but Maya snagged a bullet from DL6. This is it, the most rigged court case in history. First, we try to expose the stupid caretaker that yes, he does know who he is, and yes, he has a clear as day motive. It's insanely tense and next to impossible, but you have to prove that this is Yogi. Fingerprints. Nope, they've been erased. He apparently burnt them off in an accident. Bloody convenient. That bastard begins to mock you so hard, even suggesting ridiculous things such as cross-examining the bloody parrot. And the Madman Phoenix does it. We chat to the parrot, but he's retrained to not repeat the DL6 incident. Yeah, we connect two things. The bird's name, Polly, to Yogi's fiance, and the code's the safe, 1228 to be the date of the DL6 incident 15 years ago. And we got him. This man seriously lost everything and did nothing wrong. Except kill a guy, but whatever. Edgeworth is innocent. Edgeworth admits to his crime, but we defend him anyway. Something just doesn't add up, and there's proof that there wasn't just one gunshot from when Edgeworth threw his gun, clearing this photograph. The murderer must have taken the bullet, but why would they need it? They couldn't have, so... Uh, then Maya channels Mia once more to help out, saying they had to take it. The bullet, uh, hit the murderer. Wait, that's seriously what could have happened. The murderer must have been from the outside. Then Maya reminds us that Von Karma took a vacation after that day. He's the friggin' murderer! We instantly exposed him, but there's no second bullet. Objection! Where in, where in frick is it? It's in him! He's a cement wall anyway, he can take it. He vacated for days. No, you are not slithering out of this one, bud. Take my metal detector. Surely it's still in him. It literally has to be. Just use the metal detector. And he tries to claim that it's from something else, but the ballistic markings. It turns out that as Von Karma found himself loosely wandering after the trial, the elevator doors opened straight up. The gun was right there. And he took it. Perfect crime. Ah, and that's Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney. This script is almost 4,600 words long, so I hope you all thought this was an interesting take for a video. This was my experience with the game, and I'm not going to do the 7 hour long episode 5. It was DLC anyway, and this is a good end. Maybe next time, lads. Goodbye! Why did you do it, Lucky Ninja? Those pets had owners. Why do you keep calling me that? Who even is Lucky Ninja?